ultrasound can be used in an extraordinary number of ways to help you with your patient evaluations. In this module, we will show you the basic techniques of soft tissue and musculoskeletal ultrasound. We're going to demonstrate a variety of different applications from skin to bones, joints, and tendons. The learning objectives for this module are the sonographic technique for soft tissue and musculoskeletal structures, and the appearance of normal and common pathologies related to these structures. To meet these educational objectives, we will present 20 patients with soft tissue and musculoskeletal pathology. With regard to technique, linear array transducers are most commonly used since soft tissue and musculoskeletal structures are usually close to the skin surface. An important component of scanning soft tissue structures is to view them in perpendicular planes. To demonstrate why this is important, let's consider the contents of an egg. To fully understand the contents of an egg, you need to be able to look at it in two perpendicular planes. You will need a long axis view, also called longitudinal, and a short axis view, also called transverse. If it was possible to use ultrasound to image the egg in the short axis, it would give you an idea of the general shape and contents of the egg. However, it would not give you all the information you need to completely understand the internal contents of the egg. But if you could add a view of the egg's long axis, now you could put the two images together in your mind and really have a pretty good idea of what you are dealing with. This orientation method is often used with ultrasound imaging of soft tissue and musculoskeletal structures. Another strategy that is particularly useful for imaging the hands and the feet is a water bath. To do this, the hand or foot is submerged in water and the tip of the transducer is dipped into the water over the area of interest. The water acts as a perfect transmitter of ultrasound and provides great images. Here is an example of how to do this. This is an image of the tip of a finger using a water bath. The anechoic area proximal to the soft tissue is the water. This is the skin surface. This is the soft tissue in the tip of the finger and this is the distal phalanx. The most common use of soft tissue ultrasound is in the differentiation of cellulitis from abscess. Now let's see how you can use ultrasound to avoid unnecessary invasive procedures. Okay, let's take a look at our first case. This is a 19-year-old male who suffered an abrasion on the dorsum of his hand two weeks prior. Now he has increasing pain, swelling, and redness at the site. This is the ultrasound of the area of tenderness. There are multiple echogenic structures surrounded by anechoic fluid. At the bottom, there is a hyperechoic structure. This is the metacarpal. The pathologic pattern seen in the soft tissue is referred to as cobblestoning. The stones are areas of subcutaneous fat that are surrounded by serous fluid. This finding is seen in pathologic conditions in which extravasated fluid collects in the soft tissue. A common cause of this is edema from heart failure. However, in the case we are presenting, the fluid is caused by inflammation from cellulitis. Here is another example of cobblestoning. And this is another example. And this is another. Notice how the pattern is different in each one. Case number two. This is a 47-year-old male stung in the thigh by a bee 10 days ago. The area around the sting site has increasing pain and tenderness. As you scan the area, you see evidence of cobblestoning. However, you also find a relatively large area with mixed echogenicity. This is the classic ultrasound image of an abscess. An abscess demonstrates a heterogeneous image on the viewing screen made up of both solid and liquid components. Because of the fluid in the abscess, most will create posterior acoustic enhancement. In addition, with compression, the fluid in the abscess will move between areas of the cavity created by the infection. This finding is referred to as sonographic fluctuance. Here is another case demonstrating this finding. Gentle pressure creates movement of the pus within the abscess. Here is one more example of sonographic fluctuance. Thus, a frequent use of ultrasound at the bedside is the differentiation of cellulitis versus abscess. This is important since the treatment of these two pathologies is very different, and the clinician typically chooses between two different strategies to make the correct diagnosis. Prior to the availability of bedside ultrasound, clinicians would attempt to aspirate pus to identify the presence of an abscess. 
However, if the aspiration needle missed the abscess, the results were inaccurate. Aspiration also does not give the clinician information about the size of the abscess. And finally, the procedure is painful. By contrast, the clinician can use ultrasound at the bedside. This strategy is much more accurate in identifying the presence and size of an abscess and is comparatively much less painful. Case number three. This patient is a 38-year-old male with insulin-dependent diabetes who presents with several days of abdominal erythema and tenderness at the site where he typically injects his insulin. Using a curvilinear probe, a heterogeneous fluid collection is identified in the soft tissue over the inflamed area. It is important to note that the abscess is more than 4 centimeters deep and that a linear array transducer would not likely be able to visualize the full extent of the abscess cavity. Because of the size of the abscess on ultrasound, the patient was sent to CT and subsequently was taken to the operating room for treatment. This brings up an important point. An abscess can be like an iceberg. Many times, examination of the skin does not give an accurate indication of the size of an abscess. Most of it is beneath the skin. Ultrasound allows the clinician to fully appreciate the extent of the problem and choose the best management strategy. Case number four. A 44-year-old female presents two days after a motor vehicle collision complaining of left thigh tenderness and bruising. On physical exam, you notice a large bruise on the anterior thigh with swelling and tenderness. An x-ray of the femur and knee are unremarkable. A bedside ultrasound demonstrates a heterogeneous, fluid-filled structure over the point of maximal tenderness and ecchymosis. When color Doppler is applied, there is no evidence of blood flow. So what do you think is the diagnosis? If you said hematoma, you are correct. Although the ultrasound image looks a lot like an abscess, the history and exam are consistent with a hematoma from the recent trauma. The lack of blood flow on Doppler ultrasound is useful as well, and we will see why in a case later in the module. Case number five. This is a six-year-old male with a one-week history of a sore throat and neck tenderness. His mother tells you that there is a tender mass on his neck that is getting larger. On physical exam, his throat is erythematous without exudate. He does have a relatively large, tender mass on the right side of his neck without obvious fluctuance. So what do you think? Is this just an enlarged lymph node from pharyngitis? First, let's consider what a normal lymph node looks like with ultrasound. Here is an example of a normal lymph node. It kind of looks like a small kidney. Here is another example of a normal lymph node. It has a hyperechoic center with a hypoechoic periphery. Color Doppler can also help you with identifying lymph nodes. On the left, you see a structure consistent with a lymph node. On the right, you see the corresponding color Doppler image, and it's apparent that there is blood flow within the tissue of the node. Here is a case of a large mass on the anterior neck. The carotid artery and jugular vein can be seen at the bottom of the image. When color Doppler is applied, there is blood flow within the mass, and thus the diagnosis is lymphadenitis. In the case of our boy with a mass on his neck, ultrasound demonstrates a relatively poorly organized structure. It lacks the architecture that we typically see in a normal lymph node or even one enlarged by inflammation. When color Doppler is applied, we see some flow in the mass, but other areas where flow is not present. Because of the ultrasound findings, a CT scan is obtained. The mass has a complex structure with fluid collections. So what do you think is the diagnosis? If you are thinking separative lymphadenitis, you are correct. Case number six. This is a 45-year-old female with increasing pain and swelling in her popliteal fossa. Her past medical history is remarkable for COPD, and she is currently taking oral steroids for a recent exacerbation. This is an axial view through the mass in the popliteal fossa. Since the transducer is on the posterior surface of the knee, the top of the viewing screen is posterior, and the orientation marker is directed to the patient's left side. This examination reveals a complex mass consistent with an abscess. If you look at the bottom of the image, you can see the popliteal artery and vein. This case illustrates an important point. Be careful about draining this abscess.